thank you and welcome to our fourth annual Tech Media Telecom Competition Conference. Uh, first, want to thank all of our speakers uh, and who have uh, agreed as panelists and, and keynote speakers. Um, we're truly grateful for all their support. Uh, I also want to thank our subscribers and guests. Uh, we love this annual opportunity to bring together all of our different subscribers from government agencies to law firms to investment firms and advocacy organizations. And as everyone here knows, the Capital Forum is a media company and we distribute our journalism over the internet. So the issues of competition and power when it comes to technology, media, and telecom are of interest to us, not only because these topics are, are, are interesting to our subscribers, but also because we're one of the companies affected by this debate. So as a CEO of the Capital Forum, as a student of competition, and as a provider of high quality journalism, I really enjoy the opportunity to, to dig into these issues every year. And every year I also try to create a little bit of an intellectual framework to help us create context around what we'll hear from our panelists and our keynote speakers. Um, and I think it's fair to say, I mean, I'm not trying to be too controversial here, but I think it's fair to say that in the EU and in the US, we're in a process of breaking away from a narrow consumer welfare framework that has been dominant for uh, in anti-monopoly policy for the past 40 years or so. Uh, and there's a hearing even today in the Senate Antitrust Subcommittee that will focus precisely on that, that issue. And I, I think the best way to sum up the break from the consumer welfare frame is to quote a paper published last week by Brookings, which is, is a well-known centrist uh, think tank in Washington. And, and here's, here's the quote. Consumer welfare is no longer an adequate standard if it ever was. So that, that's just like a centrist think tank saying that. So I think you know, what, no matter what side of the debate you're on, um, the power of the consumer welfare standard over the past 40 years has, has been that there, there was a, a consensus across the political spectrum on the issue. And that era of consensus is, is clearly behind us at this point. So, we need a, another th theme, another lens, uh, you know, for this conference, I think. And uh, I, I think a good, a good theme uh, is the concept of liberty. Liberty is a word we've been hearing a lot related to anti-monopoly issues on both sides of, of the aisle. And uh, the definition of liberty is really all about perspective. And so to, to make this point, I, I, I like to use a, a parable that was made famous by Abraham Lincoln, and the parable is about the, the shepherd and the wolf. So a, a shepherd sees a wolf with a, a sheep in its mouth, and, and the shepherd approaches the wolf and frees the sheep from the wolf's grasp. And the sheep says, thank you, shepherd, for liberating me from the jaws of the wolf. And the wolf says, shepherd, how dare you infringe on my liberty to eat the sheep. Throughout the course of this conference, you'll hear the word liberty uh, you know, now and again, and I think it's probably useful to take a step back and, and try to appreciate whose liberty people are talking about defending in, in, in each uh, use of the word. And so, um, you know, we've got our, our first panel here, and I want to quickly uh, introduce our panelists, and then we'll go to a few minutes of opening remarks. Uh, Caroline Holland is a current Mozilla Tech po Policy Fellow Caroline works to promote a healthy internet by exploring current competition issues related to the internet ecosystem. She served most recently as Chief Counsel for Competition Policy and Intergovernmental, Intergovernmental Relations at the U.S. Department of Justice Antitrust Division. In that role, she was involved in several high-profile matters while overseeing the division's competition policy and advocacy efforts. Um, John Newman, Professor John Newman, is currently an assistant professor at the University of Memphis, Cecil C. Humphrey School of Law. Professor Newman's scholarship focuses on competition and innovation policy and technology markets. Uh, and uh, prior to joining the Memphis Law faculty, he practiced as an honors program trial attorney with the Antitrust Division in the U.S. Department of Justice in Washington, D.C. Jonathan Sallett. Uh, who has kindly uh, been our, our keynote speaker the past couple of years at this conference. It, uh, he provides counsel and litigation strategy at Steptoe and Johnson on matters involving antitrust law, communications law, and broader issues of competition policy. 
Um, in addition to his years in private practice, Mr. Sal recently served as general counsel on the FCC and as deputy assistant attorney general in the antitrust division at DOJ. Uh, and in the uh, Clinton administration, he served as U.S. Department of Commerce, uh, focusing on tech policy issues. Um, quick note, uh, Jonathan cannot talk, is, cannot talk about net neutrality or the AT&T merger uh, specifically. You know, uh, so we'll, when, when it comes to those questions, we're gonna, we're gonna work around Jonathan. Um, and uh, last but not least, we've got Hal Singer, who, uh, who's principal at Eco Economics Incorporated, a senior fellow at George Washington Institute of Public Policy, and an adjunct professor at Georgetown's McDonough School of Business. And uh, so with that, you know, let's jump right in. Caroline, do you wanna make, so, make your uh, opening remarks? You can, you can sit right there, yeah. Oh. I'm, I'm fine sitting. Um, well, thanks for having me, Teddy. And I just want to make two brief points uh, before we get into the uh, into the discussion. First, I want to emphasize that I think the antitrust laws are designed to be flexible and can enforce even fast-moving industries like the tech and digital sectors. Um, and second, I'll talk a little bit about how I think antitrust, enf antitrust enforcers must remain vigilant and be ready and willing to evolve and explore uh, new theories of harm, and I'll provide some examples. So first off, um, I think we've been in this debate before about whether antitrust can handle tech, only as I recall it about 10 years ago, it was more conservative voices saying, antitrust can't handle tech, just stay out of it, um, let us do our thing. And I think we, I think since then we know that's not true, we know that careful enforcement doesn't harm innovation, if anything, it's necessary to preserve and protect it. So more recently we've had, um, uh, other observers of the antitrust law and antitrust enforcement saying that maybe um, antitrust laws can handle digital and tech because it can't do enough to counter um, anti-competitive problems, that there's too much of a focus on short-term price prices as opposed to quality and, and innovation. Um, I think in response to that, we do have those tools uh, to engage in robust enforcement and we can properly take into account quality and innovation. That said, I think we can do better on those fronts. Um, and I'll talk a little about that in a minute, but also um, in addition to antitrust, we should also be thinking about what other policy tools are out there to address some of the concerns, particularly those we've heard um, about the, in the tech space. And it's possible that other policy tools, other legislative tools could be more effective um, and better than antitrust when it comes to addressing concerns of um, the health of small businesses, of our democracy, of liberty, um, of uh, protecting workers. So we need to be, have an open mind about what, what other policy tools can be used to address some of those concerns. Um, so second point is, um, all that said, I think merger enforcement should always be evolving over time. And I think it does and it has and it should, uh, should continue to. And some ideas about where antitrust enforcement should be moving that I think are particularly relevant to the digital age but obviously relevant to all industries as well. Um, first is quality and innovation. Um, the loss of competition for innovation and development of better products is significant concern, especially in the tech space where quality and innovation um, and not price may be areas where there is uh, uh, a lot of competition. Query whether we want antitrust enforcers on close cases to err on the side of enforcement or non-enforcement um, when thinking about questions of innovation. I think that's a hard question, um, and I think it's really gonna be dependent on the facts of each individual case. So I think antitrust enforcers are cautious to be finding the right cases to challenge based on those factors. Um, you need to be careful about creating bad law, but they shouldn't shy away from finding those cases to address those real and significant concerns. Another er area where I think merger enforcement um, should be moving and should be, uh, should be focusing on and thinking about is potential competition. Obviously, predicting the future in any merger context may be hard, um, but, and it may be even harder in the tech space, but that doesn't mean that enforcers shouldn't be very focused on that. And we should be really thinking about it. We should be very hypersensitive to um, the risks that solidifying dominance in particular marker, uh, markets through a merger could really be a problem um, down the line and finding those cases where uh, potential competitors really um, should be remain independent so they can continue to provide that maverick 
and um, innovative competition. Last, um, I think that, oh, so on the area of a potential competition, I think on the flip side, we want to be mindful of arguments that um, mergers are required to counter the power of particular tech companies. Um, so you need to be careful in probing in claims that competition from technology justifies a merger. Um, FTC, Office Depot, there was, um, there was talk of Amazon being a competitor, but um, the FTC did not think it was going to be sufficient enough competitor in the short term. So while we do need to be thinking about long term, we also, you can't ignore short term, um, short -term problems. And um, query how this will impact CVS Aetna. Um, last, I think uh, vertical mergers are some are an area where the enforcers should be pay particular attention, especially in the tech sector. And um, I think that we will we will continue to see development on this front, and particularly be watching the AT and T Time Warner case closely. So again, I think the antitrust tools are there. I think the agencies can always be do, always do better in enforcing, and should be willing to explore some of these novel theories. Thanks, uh, uh, John. So as Caroline uh, alluded to, this is in some ways not a new debate. I think uh, it's been going on since at least Microsoft, right? And I'd like to talk a little bit about whether tech mergers are different somehow. So it seems like the consensus answer to that uh, that came out of this debate was basically Posner's antitrust in the new economy, right? Antitrust doctrine is supple enough to take whatever tech markets might throw at it. Uh, so, is that still true? Are tech mergers different? Um, it's no big surprise, I think, to say that we see really high market shares in a lot of these markets, all right? Uh, Google, Amazon, Facebook, all in various markets own 70, 80 percent shares, if not higher. Uh, the, the big response at this point is usually that competition is just a click away. So you see the old stories about Facebook disrupting MySpace, Google disrupting Yahoo. Uh, those are pretty old stories at this point, though, right? So Facebook passed up MySpace in, in 2008. That's almost a decade ago. Uh, and Google surpassed Yahoo as the largest search engine back in 2003. That's 14 years ago. So these stories are starting to look a little creaky with age, I think. Uh, are tech mergers unique in any ways? I think so. I think the harms tend to be unique. So you can't just look for price harm in a lot of these markets. You can't look for harm to innovation because what uh, CEO ever sold a deal to his or her board by saying we're gonna innovate less, so the evidence won't be there. I'd like to talk about a couple of unique harms I see potentially occurring in tech uh, markets and mergers. One I call you can't escape harm. This is if you own multiple platforms uh, that are differentiated and users multi-home, you can uh, increase attention cost to users by putting ads in front of them across platforms. You can't escape the ads anymore. So case illustration, potentially. Um, Facebook, Instagram. So here's Sheryl Sandberg in 2016 uh, on an investor call talking about the acquisition of Instagram. She says, now we can use the targeting capabilities we've invested in across multiple platforms. She gave an example of Garmin launching a new ad campaign. She said, they targeted outdoor enthusiasts, then retargeted people who viewed the Instagram videos with carousel ads on Facebook, then they extended those ads on audience network. So you can take the ability to target across these three platforms and, quote, drive people all the way down the funnel. That's you can't escape harm, in my view. Uh, harm number two, I call split the rents harm. Here my example is Zillow Trulia. So Zillow uh, was allowed to acquire Trulia without condition. Here's Zillow Group's CEO post acquisition. Uh, so basically, we're going to encourage lower performing real estate agents to leave the platform. And we're going to help premier agents, which are those who pay a fee to uh, Zillow, gain market share in their respective markets, suggesting that basically ZG Zillow Group was using its post acquisition power uh, in the online market to help increase market power in an offline market, right? real estate mar agent markets. In exchange, these favored real estate agents pay a fee to Zillow Group that would be presumably out of the resulting rents. So that's split the rents harm. Now, these are somewhat unique. They're somewhat complex. Uh, the evidence of them, I think, is going to have to be more qualitative. In my view, that's not a bad thing. And finally, I'd like to talk about efficiencies. So are there any unique efficiencies that might be offered by tech markets? The horizontal merger guidelines talk about one particular type of efficiency as a really good one that's very often cognizable. And that involves reshifting production among multiple facilities post-acquisition. 
that's not going to be present in tech markets, right? You're not shifting production among different physical plants after a merger. So the good efficiency isn't generally going to be present. On the other hand, the horizontal merger guidelines talk about how R&D related, capital cost related, management cost related uh, efficiencies are usually not going to be cognizable. Turns out, in the few cases that have been litigated, those are the ones tech companies tend to raise. So what I see here is uh, unique types of harm that can occur. I see a maybe unique lack of efficiencies for these mergers. And all that counsels in favor, I think, of stronger enforcement. And I don't think stronger enforcement necessarily runs the risk of over-enforcement at this point. We have room to increase uh, scrutiny in these areas. Okay, thanks. Uh, John? Uh, thanks, Teddy. And <clears throat> thank you for the chance to be here and to be working with the Capital Forum in this context, which is a source of great insight into the antitrust laws and its operation. Um, and as Teddy said, because of my past governmental work, I'm not in a position to talk about specific cases like the Supreme Court petitions and net neutrality or Amex or AT&T that's now pending. But I will talk about some broader general policy issues that I think are important to the future of antitrust enforcement. Let me say that the way I, I think about this is that it's an advantage that the antitrust laws have a broad legal standard that applies across industries. Right? Sometimes industries say, as Caroline noted, gee whiz, doesn't really work for us, antitrust. But in fact, the, f the broad methodologies are very useful. And they're very useful because they allow antitrust enforcers and courts to see similarities across sectors that can help identify issues that might otherwise be less obvious. I'm going to give you a couple of examples of those. There are many, but let me just give a few. Um, I have an article out in the current ABA Antitrust Magazine on buyer power, right? In, in the merger context, people come together to purchase an input. Now, this is not a new issue. It came up a lot in agriculture over the decades, right? Farmers, lots of different farmers, say small operations selling to processing plants that are more centralized. But there's been more attention to it now, and I, and I think rightly so. So in the article, I, I, I discuss examples that include broadband sector, and perhaps most notably healthcare. The Department of Justice brought a big case uh, versus Anthem in the Anthem Cigna merger last year, which it won. And one of the allegations, which was not, I should say, decided on the merits, was that Anthem was going to use greater buyer power to pay less to physicians and hospitals, right? It's negotiating for the physicians and hospitals to be part of a network. And that that was a harm to competition. Anthem said, no, you got it backwards. It's a benefit to competition. Lower prices are good. Well, I think the Justice Department was right. I think increased bargaining leverage, separate from any true and cognizable efficiencies, poses a threat to competition. I think it demands that we understand that the quest for antitrust law is not just pricing, John made this point, and not just even lower prices, but a comp competitive process that yields outcomes. And not, by the way, only to consumers, but to participants in the marketplace. Uh, and so I think this question I is an important one. Two others very briefly. Uh, Michael Katz and I are doing an article now on market definition with multi-sided platforms. This is important because platforms, multi-sided platforms exist, again, the same thing, right? It's been for a long time. Every broadcast TV station over the air, every newspaper in 1950 were operating what we now think of as a multi-sided platform, but really important questions in multiple industries today about how we define markets, how we think about effects on different groups of users, harm to one, can it be balanced against benefits to another, and by the way, can we actually tell, for purposes of antitrust laws, what the difference is between a single-sided and multi-sided platform? I think that's hard to do. And so again, we see across industries discussions of issues that can inform each other. Uh, and then finally, uh, on vertical arrangements. I gave a speech 
before I left the ju Justice Department last year on how both the DOJ and the FTC had dealt with vertical issues in both the merger and non-merger context. And again, not a new issue, again an important issue, the cases I talked about tended to come out of concentrated industries, and again an issue that arose in industry after industry, right? We t uh, I talked about, I'm going to look at the list to make sure I don't forget, oh, entertainment, again broadband, aerospace, computing, where the same kinds of issues could arise. This doesn't mean the same answer is always given. It means the same methodology, I believe, should be consistently used to the facts as discovered and then, if necessary, litigated. Thanks. Thanks so much. And how? And how? If if, if you can, maybe a few specific comments about the AT&T merger. I know you have opinion about that. I don't know if you wanted to get to them. Uh, we can wait till questions, but uh, if you have any thoughts about that. Yeah, maybe, maybe we'll hit those in questions. Um, but I, I, I want to thank you for having me, and, um, and I'm disappointed to hear that, that Jonathan can't speak to issues of net neutrality and the AT&T Time Warner merger. I had billed this as a showdown in the octagon between Singer and Sallet. And I guess we're not going to be able to do that. Gee, gee, does anyone doubt how it will come up? I mean, <laughs> why, why do we have to do it? You know, I mean, I'm teasing you. But um, so let me turn. I just want to make three quick points, um, and mine are going to relate to this issue of tech platforms um, and problems relating to um, vertical integration and discrimination. We've we've been having a a conversation, largely because of, of, of AT&T Time Warner, but other things going on about structural versus behavioral remedies. And it has become a sort of conventional wisdom that behavioral remedies have been proven to be um, weak or, 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 or awful. And you kind of see this time and time, you fail. And, and you don't hear a lot of substance behind the comments. And I'd like to go against the conventional wisdom a bit and try to make a case for why I think that they, they can be successful and they have been successful in certain circumstances. I have a, a, a personal experience here in that um, I've, I've served in, in several matters as an expert in program carriage and program access cases, mostly against Comcast, um, and we've achieved a lot of success. Once on behalf of the NFL, we were able to force a settlement, which Comcast uh, carried us broadly. Once on behalf of Masson, which is the Baltimore Orioles, we were able to secure a settlement in which Comcast was forced to carry us broadly. Um, <clears throat> uh, uh, I've also uh, served um, uh, for Tennis Channel against Comcast. We got to a finding of discrimination. Um, and uh, you can imagine I'm, I'm no longer invited to the Comcast uh, annual Hanukkah parties. But, um, but we, do, we, we have had success. The cases take about two years. And that's probably too long, but, but I also do antitrust, and I can tell you in the antitrust arena, uh, when, we, when we litigate these out, it's somewhere between four and, and even ten years. And um, uh, if we recognize that what we're trying to solve is we want to spur innovation at the edge of the network. Uh, we have to have uh, remedies and policies and procedures that, that act quickly, um, because of course innovation will die if you give it uh, ten years. Um, but not just my personal experience, I can point to uh, under the NBCU order, uh, the, the most important case, I think, was the Bloomberg case, and of course Bloomberg uh, prevailed in that one as well, and uh, Comcast was forced to carry Bloomberg on its, uh, in a networking uh, provision that, that was around, a neighborhooding provision, I'm sorry, around other news channels. Um, there was another anonymous OVD, uh, as reported by the DOJ, that prevailed in an arbitration matter. Uh, against Comcast pursuant to the NBC rules. And of course there was Concord, and I, um, I confess I was, I was one of the experts for, Com for Concord as well against Comcast. And we won in front of an arbitrator uh, in terms of fair market value and then we lost uh, upon appeal, or at least things got tangled up in the appeals process. And so my, my nit with, with the behavioral or enforcement of non-discrimination non is really um, the appeals process. Maybe we'll get a chance to get into that, but it's not, it's not the adjudication of, of a complaint, of a discrimination uh, complaint per se. I actually have faith that that process uh, can work. We, we've had, we had a similar debate about structural versus behavioral when, um, back in 1992. Uh, now, I, I was around, but I wasn't a participant in the debate. Uh, but I can tell you the way that it, it shook out, there was, a, there, was one, there was a faction saying, don't allow cable operators to vertically integrate into, into content. And there's another faction that says, 
Uh, of course, there's libertarian factions that says let them, let them do whatever they want, but there's another faction that said, let's let them uh, vertically integrate into content, but let's, let's police them on a case-by-case -case basis uh, pursuant to a non-discrimination standard. And so those rules uh, were formulated uh, in, the, in the 1992 Cable Act, Program Access and Program Carriage, and the FCC promulgated rules that actually enforce them. And the cases that I mentioned to you, the NFL, tennis, Masson, those were all done pursuant uh, to, those, to those protections. And the decision that Congress made, and I think wisely, uh, and it's controversial, especially now that behavioral is getting this bad rap, is that um, if you're faced with one of two choices, either a categorical ban on vertical integration on the one hand, uh, and some folks, um, including some who just walked in, might, might be in favor of the categorical ban, um, uh, versus, versus allowing certain mergers to go through and policing the bad acts on a case-by-case -case basis. The problem with the categorical ban, of course, is that you're gonna end up denying some uh, mergers that could be efficient. Now, I don't want to suggest they're all going to be efficient, of course, but, but I can conceive that you can have a merger, say, of a downstream uh, platform with, say, 10% market share. I'm trying to come up with an easy case, getting some input that's really not must-have. You know, if we had a categorical ban, uh, then even that test case would be, would be blocked under the ban. So I'd much prefer that, that we, we approach these with a little more nuance. We, we try to let in the good ones uh, and police them uh, on an ex on an ex post basis uh, for for acts of discrimination, rather than rather than blocking them in out outright, and of course, um, any any merger, any vertical merger uh, that presents a, a dominant downstream provider uh, acquiring a must have input um, should be blocked. I would I would fully endorse that, but I think that we should ta again take a more nuanced approach to cases of vertical integration where the downstream distributor has a small share, say 20 to 25 percent, and is not acquiring a must-have input. I'll leave it at that. So, so I want to get into a couple questions. That first, this brings up an interesting uh, point from how that um, you know you're saying we sh we shouldn't be skeptical of these uh, of these behavioral remedies that they've been working really well, but the um, you know the current head of the antitrust division at DOJ gave a a lengthy speech um, about how he is skeptical uh, about these types of remedies. And he did reference a, a number of uh, studies uh, articulating why, why they might not work that well. So do you, you, just, you just flatly disagree? Or, I mean, and, and also just how, I mean, is it, is he gonna change, you think you can change his mind? I mean, are, are we in a world where we should be thinking about what's next, or, or you know, uh, or I guess my point is, how does this play out if the head of the AAG is saying that he already th he is flatly skeptical of them? Yeah, I think that, that what he did in in a oh, how about a rhetorical uh, sweep was he he com he lumped together all types of behavioral remedies, and if you go to the 2011 DOJ remedy guideline, you'll actually see that. The enforcement of non-discrimination provisions are singled out and are actually given an endorsement uh, in the 2011 uh, DOJ guidelines. And, and I'm telling you that from my experience in, in, in adjudicating these matters, um, we have had success in the, in the sense of forcing uh, the, the dominant distributor to settle uh, before we got to a finding. And we've, and we've achieved several, uh, in several cases, tennis and GSN, We've achieved um, a, a finding of discrimination only to get held up uh, in the appeals process. Uh, so, so every time, um, I hate to pick on my Republican friends, but every time a Republican commissioner of the FCC has been given the opportunity to vote against a finding of discrimination, they have voted against a finding of discrimination. And I'm in counseling now over this, but there are, there are two cases I'm thinking of, GSN most recently that happened um, this year, GSN v. Cablevision. Um, and um, and tennis channel and so there I admit there are warts to the to the case by case adjudication process but it isn't in the it isn't in the adjudication of the findings by the ALJ or the arbitrator per se uh, it's it's um, it's what is allowed to happen thereafter and and I would I would ask uh, 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 him and others to. When, when thinking about the proper design of, of remedies in these cases going forward, and also in certain legislation that I'm peddling, uh, to, to think about the appeals process and how it gets abused 
and whether, whether we, could, we could expedite uh, the adjudication of these discrimination uh, complaints. I want to uh, move to our next sort of thematic question, which is in the same vein. Uh, we've seen a lot more, a, a big uptick in non-horizontal enforcement lately. Um, you know, and just to get set the record and, and sort of look forward as well, what have we seen in, in the previous few years when it comes to non enforcement on non-horizontal issues uh, in the merger uh, space, and what should we expect going going forward? And let's start with uh, Jonathan Sallet. Just and, and I know you can't talk about AT and T, but right, besides I that, I, and I won't. But I I do think we saw two things. And part of this refers the second point to what Hal was talking about. If one looks at what the Justice Department and the FTC did during the Obama administration, what we saw was time and time again that the agencies took a formal position that vertical transactions or vertical arrangements, could be a contractual arrangement, could cause competitive harm, right? They took that position officially not in litigated cases, but in a series of complaints and competitive impact statements and other similar filings, where the agencies adopted these theories of harm. I think those were very important because they provide a basis, as I've said, across a multiple sets of industries for circumstances in which it is clear that what we look at in merger review, or should be clear, is harm to competition, not the structure of the transaction, as if the structure of the transaction were definitive. It isn't. It may be, it's of course important to analyze, but what we're looking at is, Section 7 of the Clayton Act, may, is the merger uh, likely to lessen competition or may it lead to a monopoly? And that can happen in a variety of circumstances, and I think that record on theories of harms helps demonstrate the circumstances. Second point on remedies. I think there has been a view sometimes expressed, which is the mirror opposite of what Hal's talking about, which is any vertical issues can be solved with a remedy. A remedy will always be efficacious. I don't think there's any basis for that. The 2011 guidelines that have been just referred to say you gotta have a remedy that can be enforced. In my mind, that means Remedies, conduct remedies, have to be able to identify the risks. You've got to know what the problems are going to be. They really have to be able to be monitored effectively. And they've got to be capable of enforcement in a timely manner, right? Because delay can be itself harm to competition. So these criteria don't tell us that there are not remedies that would pass muster. I think they do tell us that one should not assume that remedies necessarily will pass muster and that there can be cases in which the harm from vertical transaction is sufficient and the difficulties of creating a remedy complex enough that there's no answer through a conduct remedy to a potential merger. And that, I think, is, I think these two points along with the core fact that every merger requires factual investigation, Teddy, I think is likely to be what gets litigated and discussed and debated in the future. I think uh, if I could just add a point to that, I think the trends I see, you know, you do see a trend that looks like increased suspicion of vertical um, conduct you see what looks like a trend that is uh, people being less impressed with behavioral remedies. But it, it'd be a mistake, in my view, to ignore uh, what's been going on around efficiencies as well. Uh, I think there seems to be a growing body of empirical economic literature suggesting that a lot of efficiencies are illusory, that deals don't really produce efficiencies nearly as often as we might have thought they did. Uh, and that plays into all of this, right? So if you come at a given deal, even a smaller deal, I don't know if I'd go quite as small as 10%, but even if you come at it a smaller deal with the view that, uh, or, or with the question in mind of why should we allow this to go through rather than why should we block this? And that might be a more helpful framing. I think that kind of shift is what's driving some of this. Kelly? 
Well, I think the only thing I'll add is, um, uh, <clears throat> while I, I share, I think we should be really skeptical of behavioral and conduct conditions. Um, and as John said, you know, be very careful to make sure they could be effective. I do have some concerns about cutting off that tool as a potential tool altogether, to be, have such a bright line rule to say never, ever, ever, ever conduct or behavioral remedies. Um, just query whether that is um, being quite so pure is sort of cutting off an ability to maybe deal with um, some vertical mergers that may not be quite so problematic enough to block, but enough where you might have some concern that, that uh, some sort of firewall or some sort of um, uh, effective remedy could be put in place. So uh, before, before we move on to the next question, I guess what I would say to Hal Tell is me. that if I want to get my t Capital Forum channel on Comcast, I need to hire you in order to get that channel on the on, on next to CNBC is not justice, as far as I can tell. But um, so let's move on to the next question. Teddy, though. I'd work I'd work for free for you. Oh, <laughs> well now now we're talking. Now we're talking. Okay, so um, uh, next and, and actually I have a quick question for for Jonathan Salat. Um, you mentioned uh, you know enforcement uh, in the past couple of years in terms of adopting theories of harm. Are there any uh, cases in particular that you think the audience should look to? Uh, okay, these were the cases and these were the type of non-horizontal uh, arguments that we saw that we could see more of. Because I think a lot of people were surprised that there was this case brought against AT&T. Uh, not, not to bring up AT&T, I'm just mm -hmm. saying other types of conduct that we should look for in mergers going forward that you think there's been an established record? Yeah, and let me do it from other sectors, right? Um, the classic theories in vertical are input or customer foreclosure, right? Classic input foreclosure is downstream distributor buys upstream manufacturer, manufacturer is selling to other distributors. That's the upstream is a monopoly, let's say, just to make it easy and therefore control of that might affect downstream competition because rivals to the distributors can't get the input, right? Classic, simplified case. Um, in the UTC Goodrich merger, when the DOJ was concerned, it was concerned exactly about this, right? The ability to get uh, engine manufacturers for jet airplanes, if one acquired an upstream provider of a unique input to the rival, could it affect the rivalry in a way that would harm competition? Second point, innovation effects, right? We care, very important, right? This is not just about price, it's about quality and innovation. In the agricultural sector, in the Monsanto, Monsanto Delta and Pineland merger, having to do with traits being put into seeds, there was a concern about, uh, and a condition imposed in that case, uh, that the acquisition not limit the ability of innovation to come to marketplace in agriculture. And then the third area I think is very important to think about is um, competitively sensitive information. Um, the DOJ case on this one was Graph Tech Sea Drift, where there was a concern that, again, because of the ver imagine that example I gave before, right now you're buying a supplier to your rival. Well, the suppliers often have to know a lot about what the rivals are doing in their products, right? They work closely together. So if that information flowed up and then back down, you might have a direct horizontal competitor having access to proprietary information. This is a issue that the DOJ dealt with in that. And I believe this summer, the FTC in the uh, Broadcom brocade transaction imposed requirements on the limitation of the use of competitively sensitive information in very much the same way. So in all of these ways in other sectors, we've seen the agencies take the questions very seriously. So in, in, in the case that I was involved in, the Concord case, um, it, whether it was being done pursuant to DOJ or FCC, it's in front of an arbitrator, right? So the agency, the agency you know, really doesn't matter at that point in terms of where the dispute is, is going down and, and the fact-finding process and the presentation of, 
of, fine, of you know, reports and the like. Um, we, we, it was baseball style arbitration. We had to you know, convince the arbitrator that, that our price was closer to the fair market value uh, than Comcast's, Comcast's proffer, and we did. Um, <clears throat> and, at, and at that point, upon, upon a victory, what we thought was a victory, Comcast appealed it. My understanding is that that appeal, that case is still tied up in appeals to this day when you read the, the DOJ's annual reports on the status of, of these cases. Now, the, this arbitrate, no, this, I can tell you, if you go to the DOJ's annual report that's following the enforcement of the Comcast NBCU pro, you know, protections, they, the, the, the one line, and Comcast puts out a report too each year giving an update, but it just says this case is still under appeal. Um, <clears throat> and I'm not involved in the appeals. Unfortunately, they don't bring the economists in, in there. But, but um, to me, if you, You'd have to look at the totality of all the cases that are brought, including the settlement that's brought by an anonymous OVD, including the Bloomberg case. And then I would also look at the other cases, uh, program carriage and uh, cases that are done, <coughs> and access cases that are done not pursuant to NBCU, but, but pursuant instead to the just general program access and program carriage provisions. And I think that, um, I think that a, a fair reading of the efficacy of, or, or, or yeah, the efficacy of that of that treatment is going to tell you that it, it generally does well, and to the extent that it has warts, the warts uh, are in the appeals process. I think this brings up a little bit of another issue, which is, um, you know, I think people are generally a little bit confused now when they see a conservative judge, um, and it, it, you know, how is a conservative judge? going to decide on an antitrust case. Um, are there any trends? I mean, certainly uh, Macon made a big statement saying he didn't uh, approve of these, uh, 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 of, of behavioral remedies because they have a, a, because of their regulatory nature and their lack of efficacy in the recent past. Um, but if you're a conservative judge, um, anyone willing to talk about how you think a, a conservative judge or, or judges in general recently are, are receiving uh, complaints about these remedies or, or, or remedies as, a, as, a, as an argument uh, to, to get a merger through? So I think there is sort of an interesting tension if you think about um, conservatives, his, you, know, you might say conservatives were more likely to take a, you know, let the market decide, laissez-faire type view of mergers, be more permissive. Um, and uh, this tension with, well, if you find something that's not permissive, then if you're not going to remedy it, because, you know, sometimes remedies can be used as a way, well, we there are some concerns, so we'll put some remedies in here and we'll let this merger through, there's a little bit of a tension there. And obviously, an at t Time Warner came down on blocking the merger. Um, so I can see the tension with not wanting regulatory type authority or regulatory type um, remedies because the conservative view is regulation is bad. Um, in tension with this, let's let the market decide and let these mergers go through. So I think that brings up an interesting tension and potentially um, not only for the enforcers but also for judges. Um, and I worry a little bit that and maybe this would either be enforcers or judges may come down on the side of not finding <coughs> competitive problems, um, and then you don't have mergers being blocked even or even remedied. So that's where I have some concern. But there's certainly a tension. I would just yeah. say, to be bluntly honest, Teddy, I've totally given up on trying to predict anything politically <laughs> related at this point. It's just, it's anybody's game, I think. Yeah, how? Um, Specifically on the, the AT and T, uh, I, I know you think it, that that the uh, the deal should be a, a allowed to go through. Um, I'm curious what you think. You're in with if, if, with, yeah, uh, with um, protections, um, well, of course. Yeah, with protections. Yeah. But I'm curious what do you think about that courtroom dynamic where you've got the conservative DOJ, right? arguing against behavioral conditions, okay, in, in, in front of, uh, and, and on the other side, you have uh, a lobbying team that includes some people from the Obama administration who were very staunch advocates of conditions, okay, in front of a conservative judge. Um, 
are you going to make the point that regulations, uh, regulatory behavioral remedies are a good thing in front of a conservative judge? Or you uh, yeah, think I, I'm going to make the point that this isn't the kind of regulation that keeps conservatives up at night. Um, there's a whole spectrum of, of regulation. You can think of price controls and, you know, uh, they, they have in their mind, um, you know, a bureaucrat hanging out inside of the organization and monitoring what, what they're doing. You know, there is no, there is no DOJ, there's no tax on any agency, whether it's the FCC or DOJ, in the enforcement of a non-discrimination provision. No tax, okay? Um, it, is, it is adjudicated in the FCC space by an ALJ, and when we did it in the Comcast NBCU, by an arbitrator. There are no staffers there. The, they, the staffers are invited to attend uh, the adjudication, the hearing, right? But they're taking notes, okay? We're not taxing the agency, and we're not, we're not having um, government bu bureaucrats living inside of Comcast or AT&T monitoring their removes. So, so I, would, I would try to explain that, that, that enforcement of a non-discrimination standard via case-by-case -case adjudication is not your garden variety regulation. And also, Teddy, I don't know if we can get into it, but um, since you put me out there defending, I did want to I did want to highlight two two kind of interesting facts that I think are going to come up in the hearing, if I could, on AT and T Time Warner. Yeah. I don't have to do Go it ahead. now, but yeah. <clears throat> um, Jonathan mentioned input foreclosure, and so what we're all trying to figure out is would it be profitable for the merged entity um, to deny, if we consider the extreme form of input foreclosure. Um, uh, would it be profitable for the merge entity to deny uh, one of its downstream distribution rivals access to uh, one or all of the, of the upstream content uh, that is being acquired here? And so what we do as economists trying to model this, we go look, at, we go look for historical examples in which the content in question has ever been withheld from a distributor. And we ask, what was the effect? Was it able to... Was it, did it have the effect of driving customers away from the distributor that lacked access? And we have a really nice natural experiment in this case. It's not perfect, I'll go into why, but in the fourth quarter of 2014, there was a, a, a standoff between Dish and Turner. Now, it only involved uh, CNN and Cartoon Network. So uh, what I'm about to tell you, you can say, well, it would have been a different experiment if TNT and TBS had been included, but I don't think so. There's really nothing, there's nothing there. Um, and what, 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 we, what I've done is I've looked to see at what customer defection looked like at DISH during that quarter. And they lost a sizable number of, of customers on the order of 50,000, 60,000 customers that quarter. However, they have been losing 50,000, 60,000 customers per quarter going back several years now. And so when you look at what happened that quarter in comparison to any other quarter in the last three, four year period, there, there wasn't a statistically significant deviation from what you're, what you're typically seeing. In fact, Charlie Ergen, the CEO of DISH, uh, described it as a non-event when he lost access to CNN uh, and Cartoon Network for, for two months in the fourth quarter. So I think, I think that episode uh, is going to be very informative, and I think there, there may be other episodes that I'm not aware of, but that's the kind of, that's the kind of stuff that, that, that will likely uh, come to the forefront uh, in this dispute. So, uh, you know, I'm, I say, okay, if, it's, if there's not must-have content in CNN, and, you know, I love, I love Jake Tapper, but I just don't think that they're, they're I would put it in the, in the same orbit as, as regional sports networks or broadcast network when it comes to whether it's must-have. Um, the question is, what else, what else is in play here? And a lot of people point to HBO and, uh, as, being, as being the must-have content, you know, what, what AT&T could ostensibly use to drive customers. Uh, to, to one of its um, pipes. The problem for AT&T, of course, is that the, the, the um, uh, HBO is already over the top in, in, the, in the form of HBO Now, right? So, so, so Time Warner is already bypassing um, cable operators and going direct to the customer uh, to sell this product. Now, you can come up with some um, pretty uh, egregious forms of conduct that would, that would allow AT&T potentially to drive customers to its own pipes, like for example, AT&T could just pull the offering of HBO Now off the marketplace. But, but I consider this to be f a, fairly, a fairly draconian move, especially given that, that this thing is already out there. And, and finally, um, if, you, if you are worried about it, there are some natural uh, conduct provisions that would prevent AT&T from playing around in this space. And number one is they'd have to keep that, that product on the market. Number two is they wouldn't be able to discriminate in the pricing of that offer. In other words, if you come and you try to buy HBO Now 
on, online, you don't get one price if you do it through uh, an AT&T broadband connection as opposed to, to a rival's broadband connection. Um, if we're moving away from prices and output as the only metrics to uh, measure harm, what would those alternatives be? Maybe start with John, I mean, I, 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 Jonathan, well, yeah. Go ahead, John. Uh, I'd just say in a zero price market, right, there you're forced to look for non-price harm. Uh, I think you can look for increased attention costs to users. I think you can look for increased uh, information costs, so extracting more information. And this is all still sticking with a consumer welfare standard. Um, I'm a little, personally, a little suspicious of a competitive process standard at this point, given that I'm, I haven't really heard anybody define clearly what that is. I'll say that for now, consumer welfare, I forget who said the old quote about democracy, but it's a terrible standard. It's the worst possible standard, except for all the other standards. What, 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 how was it done before the consumer, before Bork's, uh, uh, how was antitrust done before Bork came along? Well, during the competitive, what I call the competitive process era, that's the 50s, 60s, and 70s, uh, I think you saw the Supreme Court condemning as per se illegal pretty much every non-standard contractual arrangement that came before it. Uh, so maybe competitive process means a state of atomistic rivalry with simple one-off spot contracts, um, but I'm not really sure. Um, look, I think it's important to remember that antitrust is litigation. It's dependent on economics. It's dependent on quantitative measures. It is not the same as economics and quantitative measures. There's a lot of evidence. There's a lot of evidence about what companies actually think, from presentations to boards of directors, for example. That's evidence. When you're preparing a case to go to court, you're looking to demonstrate that the Sherman Act or the Clayton Act, neither of which uses price as the only form of harm, is going to be violated, and you look, of course, to econometric and economic testimony, but you also look to what the parties see. And over and over again, in my experience at both agencies, we would see circumstances where economists would come in and say a certain set of facts had to be true as a matter of economic theory, and they were powerful in the presentations, and, and the economic theory was sound. But when one actually looked at the documents of what the corporations believed, it's not what the corporations believed, and more importantly, it wasn't what they were doing. Because there were other things that weren't in the economic theory that were compelling the corporations to adopt pro strategies that would go in a different way. So I don't think everything has to be able to be reduced to numbers. What everything has to be reduced to is proof. So I'll add to that, I, I think numbers are helpful, and um, it's always helpful, and there are ways to quantify it. Like in innovation, you might look at spend on R&D and whether there'd be a loss of R&D spending. Um, but I think we have to acknowledge that this is a real challenge um, in trying to quantify or, um, and I don't mean quantify in a number sense, but to present uh, to a judge that evidence that you find. I mean, on quality, you're gonna have, you, you know, it's gonna be, the um, enforcers will have their evidence, and the companies will come back and come up with some argument as to why they think their their conduct or their merger is actually improving quality. So there are going to be some tough judgment calls, and I think we should acknowledge that, and we should be thinking about how can we better quantify or assess um, quality and innovation uh, factors in mergers. I'm not, I don't have the answers to how to do that, but I think I think that's that's where the um, academia and economists should be thinking, like what are some new tools of how we can measure or assess quality and innovation? Okay, great. Um, can I, can I weigh ahead. in on this um, innovation point? Um, I, I uh, respectfully don't think that, that we can quantify it, and I don't think that we should try to quantify it. I think that we should use um, a proxy uh, for harmed innovation. Let me just um, tell you what, what I'm thinking about in particular. And so the, the last time uh, we had a what I call a pure innovation-based case brought under the, under the Sherman Act was Microsoft, which is now two decades ago. Um, and uh, something has happened in the interim, and we, have, we can speculate as to why, but, but the facts are we haven't had a case, a pure innovation-based case brought. And, and my, my um, 
uh, explanation is likely that the way that the case law has evolved um, is, is such that, that courts are demanding concrete proof of harms to consumers. Now, if you think about what happens in an innovation case, um, you, you literally have a, a, um, someone in their basement deciding to throw in the towel because they feel that the, the playing field is so slanted in favor of the vertically integrated platform that it's just not even worth their, their putting forward the effort. How are you ever going to quantify that, and hire an economist and put a number to it and present it to a court? You can't do that. And, and so this exact problem um, was, was dealt with, I think, correctly in 1992 by Congress. I go back to the, to the Cable Act protections. They, they, they recognized that uh, an independent was not going to be able to prevail under antitrust standards, even as they existed back in 1992. Um, and so instead created a, a, something, a, a forum that existed outside of antitrust, um, in, which, in which the evidentiary burden um, would not include uh, a, a proof of, of harm, of a concrete harm in the form of a price or an output effect to consumers, but instead a proof that a similarly situated content rival uh, was materially impaired in its ability to compete. And they, they use the harm to the rival as a proxy for a harm to comp for, for, as a proxy for a harm to innovation. And so the, when, I hear, when I hear calls for coming up with better ways to quantify innovation, I'm just worried that that's going down a rabbit hole that, that no econometrician you know, would ever be able to, to satisfy. All right, I think that wraps things up. Uh, before we go, I, I forgot to mention how has done work for uh, AT&T in the past, just as a disclaimer. And, but please uh, give everyone a round of applause. This was a great panel.